So welcome, hello. It's just two o'clock, so we can start. <laughs> Thank you. And as uh, and most of you know, I think all of you know, uh, we, as your member of parliament, I hold a series of two rounds of town hall meetings every year. So uh, in, in every part of the riding, at least twice a year for town halls. Is the sound quality all right back there? Everyone hears all right, not too loud, not too loud. Okay. And let me just start by asking if, uh, for any of you here, is this your first time at one of the uh, MP town halls? Anyone for first timers? Fabulous, wonderful, welcome. So then I will give a bit of a preamble. Uh, these town hall meetings are nonpartisan. In other words, this is nothing to do with the Green Party. I'm here solely as your member of parliament representing Saanich Gulf Islands. So whether, uh, whatever your political views, you're welcome. Whatever your concerns about issues, everything is open for discussion. Uh, the reason I hold the town hall is that it's my firm belief that a member of parliament's boss is, that's a very big boss, it's all the residents of the constituency. So in order to report to my boss, this is a tricky prospect, how do I know what my boss thinks, what my boss wants me to do? It is the best way, there, I use multiple uh, vehicles of communication. I think the best one is the town hall, because it's very direct, it's very personal. But you'll also find that I've been sending you um, newsletters, hard copy through your mail slot. They always ask for feedback, so there's a feedback form there to let me know what you think about things. And my office staff in Sydney is also available to you if you have issues that are specific and personal. You can always uh, contact the constituency staff, and if you need to see me personally, we can set that up too. So as your member of parliament, it's a deep honor to represent you in Canada and recently in the world. A huge honor to uh, represent the voters and the constituents of Saanich Gulf Islands. So the format for these events, I try to take no more than an opening of about 20 minutes to run through what I have been doing in, my, in the capacity of being the member of parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands. Now, usually, in the January round of meetings, I would be reporting on a full fall parliamentary agenda, legislation table, what's been going on in Parliament, usually <laughs> since mid-September. This is an unusual town hall series through January, because most of what I need to talk to you about uh, has happened outside of Parliament, uh, the climate negotiations uh, COP21, but I'll also tell you about what happened in Parliament in December. But we basically, in terms of the parliamentary agenda to report to you, it's um, it, less than uh, seven days, and I wasn't there. So I, <laughs> I will report on it, though, because it's important. And then I open the floor to your concerns, uh, issues that you want me to follow up on in Ottawa, uh, or uh, questions about what I've been doing in more detail. So it's a very cursory summary uh, for the first 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up. So obviously, what happened before October 19th, we all know we were in an election, not relevant to a nonpartisan town hall. Uh, with the appointment of the new cabinet, November 4th, we knew, I knew, as your member of parliament, who I'd be working with, who I'd be dealing with, and with whom I needed to speak on a whole range of issues. So, you know, it, before the election, I had a whole bunch of things on the hopper, whether it was talking to the Minister of Transportation repeatedly about issues of managing uh, the anchorages in Plumper Sound, for instance, or making Sandwich Inlet a no discharge zone or talking to the Minister of Environment about what we were going to do to get our marine protected area associated with uh, the Gulf Islands National Park and so on. So I started identifying cabinet ministers and working through them systematically. So I'm, I'm now through more than half the cabinet in terms of one-on-one -on -one meetings to raise issues that matter in this community as well as those that are uh, national and global. As you can imagine, in the first round of meetings, uh, quite a priority on those who had direct involvement in the climate negotiations, starting with the Prime Minister. I met with Justin Trudeau when he was Prime Minister-elect 
for about a half an hour on October 22nd uh, to make sure we, we started out on uh, what, what I felt were priorities around understanding the issues that faced Canada in the climate negotiations. Uh, so I, I will start with talking about COP21, and then I want to talk about uh, what else happened in Parliament, which gets back to the cabinet appointments, the speech, the thrill, and so on. And I know a lot of you will be very interested in the events of the climate negotiations, so feel free to ask more questions if you want to get more detail. I brought with me, um, well, not all of the paper, goodness knows, uh, the last four versions of the climate treaty as it was going through the process in Paris. So if you wanted to have a look, it, it just kind of gives you a sense, you know, including the you know, very evocative coffee stains, um, the constant scribbles. It was, a, it was a very difficult process. And we achieved in the 21st Conference of the Parties a stronger treaty than I thought we were going to have even halfway through the negotiations, even on the, this version of the treaty, this is the, the this is the Wednesday version, December 9th. This is the Thursday version, December 10th, and this is the final, the Saturday version, December 12th, the day after the conference was supposed to have been over. And what was quite exciting about the process was that the final version is stronger than the previous two, which is very unusual. <laughs> In climate talks, in any negotiations, people, you, as you can imagine, there's some caving that goes on. There wasn't, the, the only thing that I have to say is really lamentable about the final version is that we lost any reference to international aviation emissions or international shipping. But other than that, it's, it's, I think it's remarkable that the final version of the treaty is the first time that the language climate justice appears. Climate justice appears as an important concept in the preamble of the treaty for the first time in the final version. Uh, now, let me just explain briefly what the, the 21st Conference of the Parties took place. The parties are those uh, nations that have signed and ratified the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was negotiated and signed and ratified by Canada in 1992. So every year since that treaty came into effect, it came into effect in 1995, every year since 1995, there's been an annual meeting of all those countries that are parties to the convention, which is where the term Conference of the Parties comes from. And this was the 21st Conference of the Parties. And essentially the third major attempt to build on the 1992 treaty, to have a workable document to bring all nations into the job of eliminating, uh, reducing greenhouse gases to avoid what the treaty calls for. Back to 1992, treaty language called for countries to avoid, and this is in quotes, dangerous, dangerous levels of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. So human-caused emissions of greenhouse gases to levels that could be considered dangerous. So uh, Kyoto was the first major attempt in 1997. The next major attempt was Copenhagen in 2009. And that was a complete failure. It was really questionable after Copenhagen if the multilateral system in the United Nations could pull itself together to actually confront an issue as difficult, complex, with as many moving parts as you have to negotiate to have a climate treaty. I will say it was enormously satisfying for me as your member of parliament, and I've been, as, as some of you will know, I've been the only opposition party member of parliament to attend these negotiations over uh, a number of years. Since Copenhagen, I've been the only one of the opposition party members of parliament to regularly attend or attend at all. So I was well aware of the challenges and the fact that the negotiations hadn't been going very well up to that point. Uh, Canada's reemergence, and it is true, it is not um, sort of parochial self congratulations. It is actually true that Canada's reemergence as a country on uh, the good guy side of the climate negotiations made a substantial difference in the success of the negotiations in Paris. I had many times in the course of the negotiations with France from November 30th 
till late December 12th to think, thank God our election was October 19th and not December 19th. You know, there we were the great God, right? So, at election time. So he did what Canada's substantial contribution was not only that we played a positive role instead of sabotaging, but that midway through the conference, Canada came out in favor of a more ambitious position than many of our partners in the, in the industrialized world. It was on the Sunday night, December 6th, that Catherine McKenna, Minister of Environment and Climate Change, changed Canada's position or clarified it, would say, that we believe that the treaty should focus on avoiding levels of temperature rise, global average temperature, should be held to 1.5 degrees Celsius and not be satisfied with trying to avoid two. And this was a significant impact in negotiations. Canada's presentation Sunday night, December 6th, was at the opening of the ministerial portion of the negotiation. The first week was all bureaucratic diplomatic negotiations on the first draft text, which was called uh, the work of the ADP group, which stands for the Ad Hoc Working Group on the Durban Platform of Action. Uh, COP really started on Sunday night, although the world leaders all spoke on the Monday, November 30th. The, the negotiations on a real treaty started with the Sunday night talks, and Canada's, therefore, our first really substantive intervention was when Catherine McKenna said, Canada wants this to be legally binding, avoid, uh, stick to 1.5, very strong language for uh, recognition of the role of indigenous peoples. Oh, gosh, I started talking, and I had my notes, that I have not acknowledged we're on Lagotan and Masonic people territories. I want to acknowledge the traditional territories that we're on, and uh, uh, with gratitude, Heshka, I'm halfway through my presentation when I suddenly remember. But the, uh, the position Canada took internationally, we were definitely on the forefront of recognizing the role of indigenous peoples. As a matter of fact, when you negotiate in the UN system, when something isn't agreed upon, it's put in square brackets. And in our initial interventions for recognition of indigenous peoples, which is in UN language a significant statement of sovereignty for indigenous peoples, because using peoples instead of people connotes sovereignty and nationhood as opposed to just a description of, of an ethnic group, for instance. Uh, so European Union put a square bracket around the S on indigenous peoples. So you can imagine the number of square brackets on the stock market is quite astonishing. Anyway, we, we kind of did a great job. And we, we emerged with a treaty. And here's the format of how it's going to work. Everyone knows that the existing level of commitments from countries around the world are inadequate entirely inadequate to avoid two degrees, much less 1.5. Current levels of commitments to reduce greenhouse gases from countries around the world take us to somewhere between 2.5 degrees Celsius, global average temperature increase, to 3.7 degrees. Very dangerous levels indeed. So we know we need to have roughly twice as aggressive action as is currently committed. Those targets that I've, that I've referred to as inadequate are not embedded in the treaty. They are housed outside the treaty. And the format of this treaty is that every five years, all countries on Earth will meet and review the adequacy of existing commitments. Uh, it's called a global stock taking, and it's every five years. Uh, the treaty itself, called the Paris Agreement, will be signed and ratified around the world and hopefully will enter into force as a legally binding document in the year 2020. Now, for those of you who know your climate science, you'll know that to avoid 1.5 degrees Celsius, we can't wait till 2020. So fortunately, on top of the Paris Agreement, which you probably saw got most of the attention in media, there's also a conference of the parties decision. The decision, it embeds all the actions that countries around the world are going to take pre-2020. So the decision document of the Congress of the Parties uh, is within the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and it calls for the first, uh, it's called a facilitated dialogue, but it's basically the first stock taking for 2018. It also calls for a major signing ceremony of the Paris Agreement, because the world leader 
years came on day one, <laughs> November 30th, there wasn't an agreement till past, oh, so we were into overtime hours because the conference was supposed to end December 11th. So we didn't have an agreement till December 12th, and people weren't there to sign it. So the signing ceremony is going to be Earth Day, April 22nd, 2016, at the UN. And I think it's important for uh, citizen activists on climate to be pushing Prime Minister Trudeau and Environment Climate Change Minister Catherine McKenna and all of the ministers and the government to have new targets for Canada before April 22nd. That fortunately fits within the time frame of Trudeau's liberal platform in which they said that 90 days after the climate negotiations, Canada would have had consultations with all the provinces and territories and have new targets. So we've got to, we, we really have a short timeline now between now and if, if they're if we take them literally on their campaign promise, 90 days after COP ends is March 12th. And the UN meetings are April 22nd for signing, and that would be an ideal time for Justin Trudeau to bring Canada's new target and table it in New York. So I'll set aside the climate negotiations for the moment and move on to other key issues. I have to say it's been enormously exciting and encouraging, and I'm speaking in a nonpartisan sense, to see the steps that our new Prime Minister has taken towards openness and transparency. I think voters and citizens need to be aware that if you want to know what any minister in that cabinet has been assigned to do, the letter of mandate from the Prime Minister to that minister is a public document. It's public for the first time in Canadian history. So letters of mandate for every single member of cabinet can be found on the Prime Minister office website. It's nice. I no longer feel this the, the cold hand of death grip my heart when I say PMO. I actually can say Prime Minister's office website. So uh, you know it's a challenge, but essentially what you need to consider is that everything, virtually everything that I could find that was in the Liberal platform has been converted into a, an action item delivered to a specific minister. Now, as we know, it's a much smaller cabinet. So one of the things last night on a town hall on Salt Spring, one of the residents said, you know, it's a terrible shame there's no minister responsible for seniors' issues anymore. And it's true, there's some issue areas where we say, well, where did they go? The cabinet has shrunk, where did that issue area go? Uh, but it's, it's 30 cabinet members plus the prime minister. And I do think it uh, will have a salutary effect long term for Canada in terms of gender equity and women's rights that half of the cabinet members, if you leave the prime minister out of it, you add, if you add Justin in, the cabinet's slightly more men than women. But, you know, it's 15 uh, women cabinet ministers, 15 male cabinet ministers, and Justin Trudeau as prime minister. One of the things he's done that hasn't been done since before his father started wrecking things uh, is literally, in terms of my analysis of the powers of the prime minister's office, the PMO, capital P, capital M, capital O, was invented by Peter Trudeau. And the previous Prime Minister, Lester B. Pearson, did not have a centralized power base in PMO. And Lester B. Pearson, up until Justin Trudeau was our Prime Minister, Lester B. Pearson was the last Prime Minister to recognize that being Prime Minister is not a full-time job. This wasn't intended to be one man rule of a dictatorship. Uh, Lester B. Pearson was also Canada's Minister for Foreign Affairs. Every prime minister before him was a minister of something else as well as being prime minister. And you may have, you may have, you know, you may have noticed this, I don't know if it got a lot of media coverage, uh, that Justin Trudeau is prime minister and minister for intergovernmental affairs and minister responsible for youth. So it's, it's a return to a more Pearsonian uh, understanding of what a PM is supposed to do. Each one of those cabinet ministers has received a letter of mandate. You can read them. They, they follow a format. They are identical uh, as letters until you get to the part, several paragraphs in, where it says, as minister for X, I will expect you to do, and then it's very precise. But the overall letter of mandate establishes cabinet government again. In other words, it says to each minister, you're going to be responsible for what goes on in your department. You're either going to perform, or you're going to be moved. You're going to have to know what's going on in your department, and the mandate is for each cabinet.
Camp Minister to work well, be collaborative, and helpful to members of opposition parties, other colleagues in Parliament, responsive to voters. So I have found as an opposition member of Parliament, as I mentioned up front, I've been meeting one after the other after the other with cabinet ministers to raise issues. I've, it's, it's, a, it's very encouraging, absolutely wonderful, to sit down with, I've had two meetings now with John McCallum. I saw him again on Thursday. Uh, so there's a lot of openness, but it's in the mandate letter. They are instructed to be more collaborative. They are instructed to be responsible for their departments. Uh, so it is delegated again, as in the old days. This is a change we're going to need to make provincially, by the way, too. Every provincial premier's office across Canada has also followed this model. I'm hoping that the model that's changing federally will hold true and we can start restoring real cabinet uh, governance in provincial cabinets as well. Uh, and then the other thing that's in every mandate letter is respect for the independent, nonpartisan civil service. Uh, that the most important, what the, beyond any other issue stressed in every mandate letter, is a renewed and new relationship with First Nations in Canada, Métis, and Inuit peoples. It's also stressed that the challenges that the cabinet faces, the two that are really highlighted, are equity and defending the middle class and climate change. So every single mandate letter reflects concern for indigenous peoples, climate change, middle class, and respect for the civil service and operating with a new, more open, transparent, and accountable approach. These themes were also uh, reflected in the speech from the throne. Now I mentioned, I, I hope you don't, I mean, well, you may feel I made the wrong decision. I had a very difficult decision to make as your member of parliament having the climate negotiations running November 30th to December, as it turned out, 12th. The opening of Parliament, speech of the throne was December 4th, uh, and there were a few more days in Parliament the following week. Uh, Catherine McKenna, uh, having been in Paris at the opening of negotiations where Justin Trudeau and Stéphane Dion were also there, so too were Tom Mulcair, and we were all as opposition party leaders, invited to be members of our own Canadian government delegation, as was the case in years past. But they went back when Parliament reopened. Uh, only Catherine McKenna returned from the negotiations. Uh, and, and by the way, Nathan Cullen for the NDP came back uh, for the final week of negotiations as well. Uh, it was a difficult decision not to come back for the speech for Trump. But I, I decided that I actually had things I had to do as an individual for COP21, and I figured they could do the speech from the throne without my help. So, <laughs> it turned out that was true. But I did follow it closely. So the speech from the throne, of course, is the government's agenda. And again, it reflects very closely some of the issues I've already mentioned. Uh, there are five key areas of the speech from the throne. One spoke to social issues, middle class tax cut, the need for a new health accord, working with the provinces to reform Canada pension plan, uh, finding ways to reduce the cost of post-secondary education, and bringing in uh, reforms to employment insurance and a few other small things. The second piece, which is large and important, is open and transparent government. Now, the minister responsible for uh, democratic institutions is a brand new member of parliament from Peterborough. Her name is Mariam Monseth. But the open and transparent government piece is virtually all her responsibility areas. Uh, electoral reform, getting rid of first past the post. Reforming the way people are appointed to the Senate. Uh, a, a more nonpartisan Senate. And then some of the other things are really in the category of Dominic LeBlanc, the government house leader. A commitment not to misuse prorogation and not to use omnibus bills. The third piece was clean, yes, it's wonderful. No more omnibus bills. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So it's good that it's in the speech of the throne and in the mandate letters. Clean environment, strong economy, uh, another key piece. But in addition to that, there was a commitment around some other parks, and I already met with Catherine McKenna at this point, and did stress with her the importance of completing what's called the Southern Strait of Georgia, what we think of, you know, our Gulf Islands National Park, and having a marine component. Uh, the fourth piece is diversity. That's where the commitment to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is referenced, and implementing those recommendations, and of course, the Syrian refugee issue. And 
as well in that section of speech in the throne, is a renewed commitment to funding the CBC and supporting cultural and creative industries in Canada. That's also a The fifth and final piece is around security, uh, with a specific commitment to restoring more of Canada's traditional role in peacekeeping. Uh, and a discussion of reviewing C-51, but didn't say repeal it, so I have to work on that. And then trade deals, pursuing trade deals to benefit Canada. So that's a very quick run-through of what's happened since the election. I'm going to stop there. I'm, I'm grateful to so many of you for coming out for the first of the town halls of this session. Uh, just to let you know, the regular schedule will resume, which means the next town hall will be to report on everything that happens between January 25th, when Parliament reopens, and whatever happens through the spring session of Parliament, and that will be held sometime. We, I hold another round of town halls between Labor Day and when Parliament resumes in mid-September. So that's the general schedule of getting to see all of you at least twice a year. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'll go to the next question. Thanks. Um, I wrote it down so I won't forget. My name is Sam Evans. I'm one of the people behind the cannabis e-petition. Um, Michael Dempsey, the Green Party candidate for Oshawa, received your response on December 20th regarding the support for this petition. So uh, I've been in contact with him and he wants to know that, or he wanted to know that your Minister of Stuff is grateful for your assistance in pushing forward this matter. So I wanted to confirm your support and ask if I can go ahead and uh, click on submit on the petition's website. So, um, would you be able to confirm their support? Which petition? I've approved a whole bunch of e petitions so far. This is for cannabis. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah, the, that's the, the e petitions, by the way, were something that until very recently, a petition, I mean, signed zillions of them here in various town hall meetings, and I've always made the point that I can't submit a petition unless it's hard copy. We've now changed that, and we can now have e-petitions that are submitted. So I've approved e-petitions for protecting our southern uh, uh, population of, um, of orphans. We've pr pr uh, approved petitions on cannabis. Approved peti so anyway, there's a bunch of e-petitions that are now, you know, there's electronic petitions that are now approved through my member of parliament website, and this it's a, a first, a small step for uh, House of Commons coming into, um, I'd say, the, the 21st century. It's, we've been, I mean, if you can only do petitions yeah. if they're hard copy and hand signed, you're, 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 you're a long ways back. So it's nice to see e-petitions being approved. Well, this will get a lot of support. Yes. And it has support already. We do know that, uh, if just updating, because we didn't know, former Toronto Police Chief Bill Blair, who's a newly elected Liberal Member of Parliament, has been put in charge of a task force by the Prime Minister to move towards the legalization of cannabis.